السلام علیکم یا علی و علی موسی علیہ السلام ایوان تو روی شامه خورشید است گل دسته تو نشامه خورشید است چشمش که به گنبد تو روشن شد ما در یاد که خانه خانه خورشید است بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وعظيمنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وأصحابه الغر الميامين الحمد لله الذي جعلنا من المتمسكين بولاية سيدي ومولاي علي بن أبي طالب اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله أما بعد يقول الله في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل لا أسألكم عليه أجرا إلا المودة في القربة First of all, salawat in honor of Rasulullah Muhammad صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم The second in honor of Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib اللهم صلى الله عليه وآله 
the third with your loudest voices in honor of the Imam of our time, Imam Sahib Al Asr Wa Zaman. Imam Ali ibn Musa Rada, Salawatullah wa Salamuhu Ali. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Was born in the 148th year after Hijrah and died in the 203rd year after Hijrah at the age of 55. A man who is revered in all schools within the religion of Islam as being one of the greatest scholars in Islamic history and within the school of Ahlul Bayt, revered as, one of, as the eighth of the 12 infallible leaders. And indeed, a personality from whose life many extraordinary lessons may be learned. Unfortunately, today, we have not studied Imam Ali ibn Musa Radha's life in the depth that we should have. And that when you come to perform the visitation of his shrine, when you compare your knowledge about his life in relation to your knowledge about the lives of the personalities such as the first or the third Imam, you find that the knowledge related to their life is much more than the knowledge related to his. As in there are many who are able to give anecdotes and stories about the life of Imam Amir al muminin about the life of Imam al Hussein, for example. But were you to ask people to give you an understanding of the biography of Imam al Rada alayhi salam, you will find people are hard pressed to find anecdotes or words of wisdom or famous masterpieces of spirituality from him. And that's why, fortunately, a few years ago, a fantastic book was translated into the English language for the first time since it was written. Uyun Akbar al Rada, which is, of course, the book of who? The book of Sheikh al Saduq. Sheikh al Saduq wrote this book a couple of hundred years after Imam al Rada السلام, passed away. And this book is available in English at the moment. And it details not only Imam al Rada Islam's biography, but also an understanding of all his maxims and his words and his sayings. And considering the book was written 200 years after Imam al Rada passed away, it's as authentic as you're going to get a piece of literature in relation to the life of the Imam. Because we know Sheikh al Saduq came and was in this world after the period of the Ghaibah. Shortly after that period, he ensured that he wrote this book. And this book is sold in Qum. Inshallah, when we go to Qum, we'll be able to purchase a copy of this book. But as I said, it's unfortunate that we have underestimated this man's life. So let's take a glimpse and look at his life and which lessons we can learn in order that for us to build a relationship with him on this holy night. As we said, he was born on the 11th of the Qa'da in the 148th year after Hijrah. His mother was originally of North African descent. In some narrations, her name is Najma. In other narrations, her name is Arwa. And this is not something uncommon for the Imams of Ahl al-Bayt to marry a lady who is not from Medina. As in sometimes in Muslim communities, you find that when a person wants to get married, it is stipulated to them that they can only marry even from their village. There are certain Muslim countries in the world where their wife will only be from their village. If she's from outside of their village, they will not marry her. Then there are other Muslim countries in the world where you'll find that no, the wife is not from the village. They don't mind if the wife is from the country. We don't mind. The wife can be from the same country as us. Then you find a minority of Muslims who follow the sunnah of the Imams of Al Muhammad by doing what? By saying that if Imam al Sadiq can marry Hamida from Africa, and if Imam al Kadhim can marry Arwa from North Africa, and this Arwa can give a child like Ali ibn Musa, or can give a daughter like Fatima Ma'suma, then what's the harm of someone marrying from outside of their country? Listen, would you believe even in the Shia world today, we have a group of people who say, because I'm a Sayyid, I'll only marry a Sayyidah. Say, what do you mean, because you're a Sayyid, I'll only marry a Sayyidah? Say, yes, at the end of the day, I'm from the descent of Rasulullah, and I can only marry someone from that line. 
You reply, hold on a minute. Musa ibn Ja'far married a Sayyida. Ja'far al-Sadiq married a Sayyida. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, when he married Sharban, who she's a Sayyida. As in, if the Imams of Al Muhammad can marry a lady who's not from the same lineage, then why is it that in our villages today you have this village mentality that I'll only give my daughter away to someone who's equal to me in ancestry? Imam al Kadhim highlighted something for us. What was it? That's when the verse in the Quran said, What? Ya Yuhannas anna khalaqna kum min dhakarin wa untha wa ja'alna kum shu'uba wa qaba'ila li ta'arafu in akrama kum Allah atqaakum. The best amongst you in the eyes of Allah is who? The one who has got taqwa. Not the one who is a Sayyid greater than a non-Sayyid. Not the one who's from this part of the Middle East and not from that part. No. The Imams from Imam al Hussein, then from Imam al Sadiq, Imam al Kadhim, Imam al Rada, Imam al Jawad, Imam al Adi, Imam al Askari, even Imam al Hujja, Ajalallah, Farajah al Sharif. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Imam al Hujja is his mother from Medina? No. You would think his mother may be from the origin. No. Is his mother from Kufa? No. The narrations point to us that his mother, if anything, if the narrations are to be taken, is of Roman descent. Roman. Imam al Askari can't marry a Sayyida? Of course he can. But Imam al Askari is highlighting if there is a noble woman, then there is no harm in marrying her, irrespective of her background. That's number one. Number two, when Imam al Kadhim marries a lady of this descent, he also knows some cultures have traits, others don't. When you marry from those cultures, you may be able to share characteristics which maybe your culture doesn't have. What do I mean? I mean when he marries someone from Africa, the people of Africa may be known for the fact that, let's say their women are loyal, their women are dedicated, their women are humble. Sometimes an imam may see no, in his own culture they don't have these traits. When I marry from another culture, I may bring about certain traits into my environment from that culture. Number three, I may also bring the people of her city towards my religion. What do we mean? If I'm only marrying from the people of Medina all the time, the people of Medina are already in my religion. If I marry from a certain area where they haven't come towards Ahl al-Bayt, and I treat their daughter properly, then upon treating their daughter properly, what will happen? The others in her community will say, our daughter married someone from that city and they've treated her very well, then we want to join the religion of that person. Therefore, Imam al radha his mother was who? Was a lady of African descent. And upon his birth in the 11th of the Qa'da, you find that they named him Ali. This is a very delicate point I want you to understand. The most common name of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt you'd find is Ali, isn't it? Who do we have of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt? Ali ibn Abi Talib, and we have Ali, Zayn al Abidin, and Ali ibn Musa al Rada, and who? Imam Ali al Hadi. Why would Al Muhammad focus on naming Ali constantly? Is there no other name in the world for you to name your child? As an Imam Musa ibn Ja'far, when he has a choice of naming his child, he could easily name another name. It's because Al Muhammad knew that the most fought name and the name who people's blood was shed because was Ali ibn Abi Talib's. What do we mean? Do you know from the time of people like Muawiyah through the time of people like Hajjaj, if on your identity card on those days you were called Ali, you were to be executed. Muawiyah met Ibn Abbas one day. He said to him, I heard you had a child, congratulations. He said to him, oh, thank you very much. He said to him, what did you name him? He said, I named him Ali. He said, you've got no other name in this planet to name except that? Couldn't you give him another name? He said to him, and what's wrong with it? He said, there are so many other names. You give him the name of that man? You find even that type of hatred that existed there? Hajjaj ibn Yusuf al-Thaqafi in Eid al-Adha, when people were sacrificing animals at Hajj, Hajjaj would go around to the people. He would say, what are people doing today? They say they sacrifice sheep today. He said, yes. He said, yes. He said, very well, catch for me anyone called Ali. Let's sacrifice him today. People were killed because of the name Ali. It was seen as an identity that Ali ibn Abi Talib's name was remaining alive. 
The Imams of Al Muhammad, why would they ensure their sons were called Ali? Someone could say, you've already named Ali Zain al Abidin. You've named, why do you need to name anymore? No. We have to ensure even in our naming that sometimes a person may be tempted to give their child a name which is the name which they feel is a cool name, something which fits into their society. Whereas these names like Ali, whenever you turn around anywhere in the world and you see someone called Ali, you know the flag of Ali ibn Abi Talib is still rising high. When many Umayyah bin Abbas try to destroy this name, when Imam al kadhim names him Ali ibn Musa Rida, when he names him Ali, what's the reason? To ensure that the name is alive forever. And that's why you find that that first period of the life of Imam Ali ibn Musa Rida was an extremely difficult period for his family. Because Imam al kadhim how many children did he have? Imam al kadhim according to Shaykh al-Mufid, Shaykh al-Mufid says Imam al kadhim had 37 children. He had 19 daughters and 18 sons. And of these 19 daughters and 18 sons, some of them faced the worst period any of the children of Al Muhammad would ever face. That Imam Ali ibn Musa Rada says, in my youth, we were very young. He says, in my youth, Jaludi, Jaludi used to be a prison guard for Harun al-Rashid. He says, Jaludi would come and enter upon our houses. And he says, he just enter, the daughters of Al Muhammad are all covered up. He said, my father, Imam Musa ibn Ja'far, would be in prison. I would have to look after the house while my father's in prison. Remember, Imam al Rada became Imam at which age? 25. He said, the first 25 years, while my father was in prison, I'm the head of the house. And I've got all of these daughters, 19, imagine 19 sisters who are from the line of Imam Musa al-Kadhim. That's why today someone always asks, why are many Sayyids Musawi Sayyids? If Imam Musa ibn Ja'far had 37 children, the majority of us are going to be Musawis, aren't we? You find that of these sisters, they're in the house, Jaludi narrates, or Imam narrates that Jaludi would walk into the house. He said on one occasion, Jaludi walked in. The granddaughters of Fatima al-Zahra are all sitting around alone he walks in and he says i want to pull the earrings of these ladies imam al rada says at the moment he said i want to pull the earrings of these ladies i looked at him and i said you will not touch any of their earrings he said very well if i'm not going to be allowed to touch their earrings then what am i going to do i'll burn the house imam al rada alayhi salam says I saw the daughters of Fatima al Zahra run from one part of the house to the other. Similar to Imam al Sadiq. Imam al Sadiq, when he saw the daughters of Fatima al Zahra and his house running from one part to the other, he said, Only now I remembered Zainab on the 11th night of the 11th of Muharram. Imam al Rada says, My father Musa ibn Ja'far was in prison and they've burned the house. He said, Oh Allah, in the name of Musa and Ibrahim and all of those who face oppressors, stop this fire from burning us. He said, Alhamdulillah, the fire was stopped. But he said the humiliation we would have to go through, that they try and burn our houses. Harun al-Rashid would have us imprisoned and have my father imprisoned. And he'd say we wouldn't even be able to see my father. He'd say the access to my father was difficult. Do you know how difficult it was to see Imam Musa ibn Ja'far? Imam Musa ibn Ja'far was moved four prisons, brothers and sisters. All of you visited him last week. Four prisons, Imam Musa ibn Ja'far, taken from the Qantara prison to the prison of Baghdad to the prison of Basra, one after the other. And Imam Ali ibn Musa Rada and Bibi Ma'suma in Qum, who will be, inshallah will be with her tomorrow. Bibi Ma'suma would say, I was so young and I couldn't see my father because my father would be in prison with no one to protect us. Imam Rada alayhi salam, until he finally narrates that when I was 25 years of age, the Imam had came to me after we heard my father had been killed. And he narrates to us what type of torture his father faced in prison. He says the last prison they put my father in was a prison which was like a skinny pillar where you're not allowed to stretch your hands. Imam Musa ibn Ja'far of the 20 years in prison, the last one was the most torturous because they would make him stand in the middle of a pillar and they put a rock on top of this type of prison and Imam al-Rada narrates to us, when they'd remove the rock so he'd have some sunlight coming in. It was all darkness. When they'd remove the rock for some sunlight, he'd say that he'd put his head outside just to try and see the sunlight and the guards would kick his head. 
And he said a dua of my father, my father in his last days would say, Allah, I thank you. And I thanked you for putting me in prison so I may worship you alone. But now, Ya Allah, I beg of you, let me out of the prisons of Harun al-Rashid. Imagine how much torture this man went through until Imam al-Radha says that on the Friday we were told that my father would meet us. He said on the, fr on the Friday an announcement was made on the bridge of Baghdad. Oh, Shia, there's a body which lies on the bridge of Baghdad. Said we went to pick up that body. I see the body of my father lying on the bridge of Baghdad. But he assumed the caliphate at which age he assumed the imama at the age of 25. And when he assumed the imama at the age of 25, something very interesting had occurred. Number one, Imam al Rada did not have any children up until the age of 44 even. Some narrations mention, some go on to say 46, 47. You find Imam al Rada did not have any children. In his 20s, people would say to him, where's your child? Say, inshallah, God blesses us with a child. In his 30s, where's your child? Inshallah, God blesses us with a child. In his 40s, where's your child? Inshallah, God blesses us with a child. And it's a beautiful lesson for all of us. Why? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even the imams of Al Muhammad, he tests them without having a child. Sometimes in life, maybe in our 20s, in our 30s, in our 40s, we begin to think to ourselves, do we have any children? No, we don't. There's no one to look after our message. Or there's no one to look after our lineage. If Allah can test Zakaria with Yahya and Ibrahim with Ismail, Allah likewise tested Imam al-Rada alayhi salam. But Imam al-Rada, everywhere he'd walk when he became an Imam, everywhere he'd walk, people would come up to him. Do you have a child yet? Like, no, I don't. Do you have a child? No, I don't. Do you have a child? No, I don't. He remained patient in this period as there's no child to look after his message. He had got married in this period. And there was a power struggle happening in Bani Abbas's empire. Between who? Between the sons of Harun al-Rashid. Harun al-Rashid had amongst his sons, Al-Amin, and what's the name of his other son? Ma'moon. Thank you. Al-Amin and Al-Ma'moon. They came from different backgrounds. Al-Amin's mom, pure, Arab, one of the most noble women in Arabia and even in some of our hadith books, a lady who at the end of her life came towards the path of Imam al-Rada alayhi salam. Al-Ma'moon, his birth is interesting. He was born from a chessboard. Someone says, how could someone be born from a chessboard? You can't be born from a chessboard. <coughs> Al Ma'moon was born from where? A chessboard. How? This Harun al Rashid, when he'd sit with Zubaydah in his house, you know, these people, Harun al Rashid, these are all kings, got nothing much else to do apart from playing these games and the alcohol surrounds them and so on. So they get bored of playing this chess game sometimes. I'm going to try and be as diplomatic in my language in this story as possible so I hope the elders they understand what I'm trying to say so he's looking at her when they're playing chess on one occasion and he says to her if I win then you could dare me to do anything then I could dare you to do anything but if you win you could dare me to do anything playing chess he wins says it's my dear she says go ahead says, walk around this palace of mine in the nude. She looks at him and says, soldiers here. There's many soldiers. I said, how do I walk around here? It's like, and then they go do this. Here's a palace, and you have all of these guards. Walk around, but come back quickly. Walk around, come back. Let's continue playing. Subhanallah, imams of Al-Muhammad are in prison. And you have these types of people ruling Islam. Play, and then she wins. So she says, I dare you. What is it? She says, you know, we have this slave, the cook in the kitchen. She says, which one? She says, you know, this one, this one, this one, the ugliest looking one in the kitchen. Someone who nobody even wants to look at. And of course, all creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are beautiful. But relatively, that was what was said. <coughs> so he said, yes. She said, I want you to be next to her. 
That night, from being next to her, who was born? Al Ma'moon. Al Ma'moon's background is therefore what? Of all the politeness I can say, his background is from a non Arab birth. I could say other types of birth, but a non Arab birth. Al Amin, his background is what? Pure Arab. Harun al Rashid wanted Al Amin to take over, and Al Amin took over, but was not willing to give any power rights to Al Ma'moon. The schism occurs between the two of them where Al Ma'mun and Al Amin have this hatred between each other. And subhanAllah, history shows us, shows us so many times that the biggest hatred you can have in a house sometimes is between two brothers, isn't it? From the time of Habil and Qabil to Yusuf and Ya'qub towards Al Ma'mun and Al Amin. And that's why, as the poets would say, Yusuf had 11 brothers, Hussein had one Abbas, isn't it? Yusuf, how many brothers he had? 11 but Hussein had one Abbas that one brother is greater than 11 you find that these two had a war with each other until Al Ma'mun defeated Al Amin <coughs> upon defeating him what happened Al Ma'mun assumed power but when Al Ma'mun assumed power he knew very well the only way I'm going to establish my stranglehold in power is by saying that I'm not going to be oppressive towards Al Muhammad I'm not like Harun al Rashid putting them in prison. I'm not like Mansur al Dawaniqi ordering people to be put in prison. No, I am going to make a decision. What's the decision? Ali ibn Musa Rida is going to be my successor. And I am going to ask him to come from where he is in the land of Medina and from the land of Baghdad to come towards where? To come towards this area by the name of Khurasan. He is going to come. And he's going to be my heir apparent. Of course, when he said this, he has no intention of making Imam al-Radha his heir apparent, has he? There's no intention. When he's asked Imam al-Radha to come, it's just a political move. In those days, this area, Khurasan, that we're in now, in those days, this area, what was it? It was a beautiful garden, which Ibn Qahtaba had decided was an area where Abbas al Khulafa should be allowed to be. You found that Imam al Rada alayhi salam was ordered. You leave your house, you leave your family, and you have to come towards Al Ma'moon in this area. Imam al Rada alayhi salam, at this stage, he finally had a child. In his 40s, he had a child, his only child, according to most narrations. Who was it? Imam al Jawad alayhi salam. He had Imam al Jawad alayhi salam. And then he had to tell his closest companions, I'm now leaving to go towards where? To go towards Khurasan, to go towards Tus, and I'm going to go towards this caliph. He has ordered me to be the heir apparent. The companion said to him, Oh Imam, does this mean that you're actually going to succeed him? He said, No, I will not succeed him. This man will never allow me to succeed him. Some of the Shia began to get angry. Some of the Shia said, how dare you, as a leader of this school, go and work under a man who's oppressive? Don't you have respect for yourself? And I tell you, sometimes the biggest trouble faced by Imam al-Rada was from the Shia. Imam al-Rada, some of the biggest trouble he faced was from his own Shia. And I hope we don't give this trouble to the Imam of our time, inshallah. You know Imam al-Rada, when he became Imam, there were certain Shia who didn't even follow him. Why? There was a group called Al-Waqafiyah. Waqafiyah stopped at Imam Al-Kadhim. Why? Waqafiyah amongst them, Ziyad Al-Qandi, Ali ibn Abi Hamza, they used to be big khums collectors. I'm not going to allow Mus uh, Ali ibn Musa al-Rada to become an Imam. The khums will leave my hands. I've got 70,000 dinar of khums. He's got 30,000 dinar of khums. Ali ibn Musa Rada, there's no way I'll follow him. And they formed a sect called the Waqafiyah saying, Imam al Kadhim has gone into Ghaybah, he'll come back one day. Just so that they don't hand over their money again. Imam al Rada alayhi salam, his Shia were telling him, How dare you? He answered them in the most beautiful way. He said to them, as we mentioned, he said to them, Who's greater, a prophet or a wasi? They said, A prophet. He said, Who's worse, a believer or a mushrik? He said, A mushrik. He said, well, if a prophet like Yusuf can work under a mushrik, then what is wrong with me working under this man's government? Isn't it? Nabi Yusuf alayhi salam, didn't he work for a, a leader who was a mushrik, a leader who was a polytheist? 
When he said, قَالَ جَعَلْنِي عَلَىٰ خَزَائِنِ الْأَرْضِ He was working under a non-Muslim government. Today someone asks amongst you, if I enter politics, can I work under a non-Muslim government or no? Why not? As long as you're not compromising your beliefs in Al Muhammad, your principles, your jurisprudence, there's no harm working under a non-Muslim government in order that you look after the state of the Muslims. Imam al Rada alayhi salam left the land to go towards who? To go towards Al Ma'mun. On his way amongst the cities he stopped in was which city? Who can tell me? Amongst the way, uh, amongst the cities he stopped in. And inshallah, brothers and sisters, take these pieces of knowledge on board. When you hold his shrine, promise him you'll learn more about him. We've learned about one or two imams and we've neglected the rest to tell you the honest truth. One of the cities he stayed in was the city of Qum. And he established majalis and muharram in the city of Qum. And one of the biggest houses in Qum until today was established on behalf of where? His ride had stopped when he came to Qum. Therefore, the establishment of Majalis and Muharram in the land of Qum, Imam Ali ibn Musa Rada, when he came towards the land of Qum, he stopped there. He ordered that in Muharram, 10 nights of Majalis are to be recited. For who? To be recited in the area of Qum and it spread around the Muslim world. Today, when we have Ashura, how many nights do we normally have in the mosque? 10. Imam al Rada in Qum had ordered that 10 nights of Majalis are done. And having left the area of Qum, he now came towards this area. When he came towards this area, everyone had flocked. The whole world had come out of that particular area, waiting for Imam al -Rada. When he came in, everybody saw him. People were thinking he's going to come. Golden carriage, the most beautiful horse. He came in simply into the area. Kalimat la ilaha illallah husni. That's it? He's got nothing else to say? Then he came back and he said, I am one of the conditions of belief in La ilaha illallah. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. He said, La ilaha illallah is the fortress of God. Whoever enters it is safe from God's punishment. Then he turned around and said, I am one of the conditions of La ilaha illallah. If any time you say La ilaha illallah, Know that belief in me and my grandfathers is one of the conditions. And you know what he did before he said this hadith? He said, my father Musa ibn Ja'far heard from his father Ja'far bin Muhammad, heard from his father Muhammad bin Ali, heard from his father Ali ibn al Hussein, heard from the master of the martyrs at Karbala, heard from Imam al Hassan, from Imam Ali, from Rasul Allah, from Jibra'il, from the heavens, that la ilaha illallah. Do you know what we call this in hadith today, in hadith studies? Who could tell me what it's called? The golden chain. It's the most pure chain you can ever have for a hadith, isn't it? Can you ever have a more purer chain? Musa ibn Ja'far and Ja'far bin Muhammad and Muhammad bin Ali and Ali ibn al-Husayn. The purest chain. In hadith studies, they call this the golden chain. Because it's the purest form of any hadith discussion you can ever have. al Ma'mun noticed that he had said this. al Ma'mun therefore came to Imam al -Rada. he said to him, thank you for coming here. I now want to announce to you that I want you to be the Khalifa after me. Imam al -Rada said, you can't do this. He said, what do you mean? He said, if Allah has chosen you to be Khalifa, then you can't give away that which belongs to Allah. Isn't it? If Allah has appointed you as Khalifa, who are you to give it away? You have to work for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If Allah hasn't chosen you, then once again, who are you to give me this caliphate? This doesn't belong to you. From the beginning, Imam al Rada was pointing out, there's no way I'm remaining silent against this man's dhulm. Because as I mentioned yesterday, when people would come and visit al Ma'mun and Imam al Rada, when sometimes people would come and visit, they'd come and they'd ask the Imam a question. Like I mentioned yesterday, someone came and said, both of them came, they said, Oh, Imam, we have come from a long journey. Should we pray Qasr prayers or we pray full? Imam looked at the first one. He said, who have you come to visit? He said, I've come to visit you. He looked at the second one and said, who have you come to visit? He said, I've come to visit al Ma'mun." He said, very well. You, the first one, pray Qasr. The second one, you keep praying full. Because you pray Qasr, because you've come to see the Imam, you should still follow the laws of Islam. 
But you who have come to pray full, you are someone, you have come to see Al Ma'moon, you should pray full. What's the point of worrying about Qasr and full when you've come to see who? Al Ma'moon. Imam would make this point clear as well. But the biggest attack Imam gave Al Ma'moon was Salat Al Eid. Why? Al Ma'moon tried to convince everyone that, look, I'm going to let Ali ibn Musa Rida come and he's going to lead Salat Al Eid. And I'm going to promise you that this is the man I want to look after the religion of Islam. Imam Ali Muslim said, I'll pray Salat al Eid the way Rasulullah prayed. Do you allow me? He said, Yes, yes, do not worry, pray. Everyone was waiting for Imam Ali ibn Musa Rada. That day it was Eid. The way Rasulullah prayed Salat al Eid is how you'd come to Salat al Eid barefooted. We all go Salat al Eid. Wallah, we have a hundred forms of clothes on our body. And we have the best of shoes. Rasulullah would go Salat al Eid barefooted in an open space with his turban on, shouting out, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Imam al Rada followed the Sunnah exactly. When he is walking, barefooted, shouting out, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, in the turban of his grandfather, Rasulullah, the whole of this area suddenly started following Imam al Rada. Salam. Everybody was in tears. Everybody wanted to come and pray behind him. For the first time in over 150 years, the true flavor of Islam was back again. All of a sudden, people were seeing. That this is how Rasulullah was praying. This is how he was acting. A man of Al Ma'moon's party came to Al Ma'moon. He said to Al Ma'moon, "Hurry up, hurry up!" He said, "What is it?" He said, "Can you see how many people are behind Imam Ali ibn Musa Rada? Do you think five, ten people? Flocks of people were following Imam Rada." Al Ma'moon said, "Stop! Take, tell him to go home." So what do you mean? He said, "Tell him to go home." There's no way he can lead salah because the more people pray behind him, the less powerful I am. So they said to Al Ma'moon that this Ali ibn Musa Rada, you're going to have to find a way of getting rid of him or embarrass him. He said, Very well, I'll embarrass him in the best of ways. They said, Which way? He said, I'm going to invite the greatest priests of Christianity and the greatest rabbis of the Jews and the greatest priests of the Hindus and the atheists, and I'm going to bring them in front of him. And I'm telling you, nobody can defeat these people. These people, when they debate you, they'll finish you. This man will be embarrassed. My respect will come back. Christian priest came. Jewish priest came. The atheist priest, if there is one, came. The Hindu priest came. Like that famous person who said to me, he said, Ammar, these atheists, if they're good people, surely they can go to Jannah. I said, the atheist doesn't even believe in Jannah. Why do you want to put him there? The Hindus... The Buddhist, all of these came in front of Imam al-Rada. Al-Ma'moon bought them. He said, listen, this Ali ibn Musa, people love him for his knowledge. Give him some arguments he can't answer. I'll just give you a glimpse of the arguments. In my other lectures, I've gone through this whole dialogue. A glimpse, the Christian priest looked at him. He said, Ali said, yes. What does your religion say about Jesus? He said, our religion loves Prophet Jesus. And what does your religion say about Muhammad? He says, well, we have great reverence for Muhammad. He said, who's greater? So Imam al Rada said, oh, the Prophet Muhammad is greater than the Prophet Jesus. He said to him, what did you say? He said, he's greater because he used to pray and fast more than the Prophet Jesus. He looked at him and he said to him, how dare you say that someone prayed and fasted more than the Lord Jesus. Imam al Rada looked at him and he said, Oh, Christian priest, if he is your Lord, can you tell me who he was praying to? A Lord is praying to a Lord? The Christian priest turned around, he said, You know, Al Ma'mun, you can bring others to handle this guy. This is enough for me. The Jewish priest, he said to him, Which prophets do you believe in? He said, We believe in Adam and Noah and Abraham and Isaac and Ishmael, and we believe in Moses, David, Solomon. And he said to him, how about Jesus? So the Christian priest is looking now. He's thinking, hold on, Jesus. Now he's defending Jesus. Let me see what happens. He says to him, how about Jesus? He's like, we don't believe in Jesus. He's like, why? He goes, because the basis of our belief in any prophet is miracles. So he said, so that's the basis of your belief? He said, yes. He said, Moses had miracles. He said, well, Jesus had miracles. He cured the blind and the sick and the leper. He said, yes, but we have these documented in our books. We don't believe in this about Jesus. Because we never saw Jesus perform these things. 
So he said to him, oh Jewish priest, are you telling me you were there when Moses made the stick become a snake? He said to him, no, I wasn't. He said, so if you're using that criteria, then you can't believe in Moses or Jesus. He told him, Ma'mun, you know what, I'm going home. This is, forget about this discussion. The Christian priest thought, let me come back. That sounded like a good argument to use against them. And then he saw the atheist and a glimpse of the atheist. The atheist said to him, how can you believe in a Lord who you can't see or you can't sense and he is not perceptible? Surely you have to disbelieve in him. He said, oh, atheist, that made you disbelieve in him. It made us believe in him. Because when our Lord cannot be sensed or seen or found by the senses, that's when we knew we were limited and he was unlimited. SubhanAllah, the atheist says to you, I can't see God. But that's when you then realize that you are limited. Then there must be that which is unlimited, which cannot be defined. Explaining all of this, al mamuns frustrated. Ali ibn Musa Rada has become a calamity for me here. I bought him so that my power becomes stronger. Instead, my power is weakening. So you know what he said to him? He said, you know what? I'm going to bring the best doctors. Brothers and sisters, I want you to type on Google. Golden medical dissertation. What did I say? Golden medical dissertation. al Ma'mun gets the best of the doctors. And they try and write about medicine. Write about what? Medicine. So they come to Ali ibn Musa and they're like, look at us. What can Islam say about medicine? When we have all this knowledge about medicine, Imam Ali ibn Musa Rada said, you want to know about how medicine works? He began to explain the whole function of the body. What the heart does, what the liver does, what the blood needs, what the blood doesn't need, what the head needs, what the head doesn't need. Why the feet were created and the way they were created, the shape they were created and everything. Al Ma'mun, look how clever this Al Ma'mun is, honestly. Al Ma'mun looked at him, he's like, you know what, I wanted to kill him. But if I actually write this dissertation, which he's just said in gold, I can make lots of money out of it. So what Al Ma'mun did is he ordered that Imam Rada's medical dissertation, his medical lecture was written in gold. Gold, not written in ink. They actually wrote it in gold. And until today, it is called, if you actually Google it and look for it in the great Islamic websites, the Golden Medical Dissertation of Ali ibn Musa. Al Ma'mun therefore tried every step. He worked on the dissertation. He worked on these areas. Still, he wasn't getting rid of the Imam. And the Imam only had a few close friends here in this land. And amongst his closest friends, do you know who? The poets who would recite in honor of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. Those who are very close to Ali ibn Musa Rada. You find, for example, Da'bal bin Ali al Khaza'i. Amongst them, this Da'bal bin Ali al Khaza'i was one of the greatest Shia of Imam Ali ibn Musa Rada. And he's the one who made the famous lines of poetry, which many scholars recite until today, where he talks to Fatima al Zahra about the 10th of Muharram and Karbala and what happened after Karbala, until he gets to the line and there is a pure soul by the name of Imam Musa al kadhim who is buried in Baghdad, then Imam al radha adds a line, and there is a pure soul in the land of Tus who will be alone. This Ja'bal bin Ali al-Khazai says, at the time I wondered what was Ali ibn Musa al referring to when he told me that there is a pure soul in Tus. At the time Imam al-Radha had not died. He said it was only later on when he died that I knew why he finished those lines of poetry for me. And he told Ja'bal, he said, Ja'bal, for these lines of poetry, what do you want from me? Please listen to this, brothers and sisters. What do you want from me? He said, I want your shirt, O Imam. He said to him, why? He said, so that when I die, my kafan, your shirt becomes the kafan on my body. Then Imam al said to him, Da'bal, I will not only give you a shirt, I'll give you a hundred dinar which have got my name on it. Sometimes people say to me, why do we call Imam al Imam Zamin or Imam Zamin? Why? One of the opinions is because Imam al-Radha's name was written on the coins of al mamuns government. Whenever anyone would travel, they'd have the coin in their pocket. And a coin with the name of an Imam of al Muhammad. there's no way you'll be affected on a journey, isn't it? Another opinion comes later on regarding the story of the day and Imam al Hussein. You therefore find that he told Da'bal bin Ali al-Khuza'i, Da'bal on your way to Qom, take these coins with you. He said to him, why? He said, take these coins with you, Da'bal. I've given you the last line of poetry for your poetry. And I've given you my shirt. 
and I want you to take these coins which have my name on them. Jabal bin Ali al Khazai narrates, We were on our way to Qom. He said, On our way to Qom, these thieves overtook our caravan. When they overtook our caravan, they stole everything from our caravan. He said, When they stole everything, we're sitting there thinking, What are we going to do? All I have left with me is the shirt which Imam al Rada gave me, which I want to use as my kafan. Ja'bal says, at this moment I hear the leader of the group, and so on, and he continued with the lines of Ja'bal bin Ali. Ja'bal is like, hold on a minute. Those are my lines. The news of Ja'bal's poetry had spread so fast that even the heads of thieves were reciting Ja'bal's poetry. Dabal had just recited the poetry where? Next to Imam al Rada here. And the thieves on the way had loved the poetry so much they memorized it. So Dabal looks at the man, he's like, Do you know whose poetry you're reciting? He's like, Yes, a man called Dabal bin Ali al Khazai. He must be a great poet. He looked at him, he said, I'm Dabal bin Ali al Khazai. He's like, No way. How did you write this poetry? He's like, what do you mean? He goes, you know, I steal and I'm sometimes not religious, but I love Imam al Hussein. I'm sure you've met a few like that in your life. I steal, I do everything, everything haram I do. But I love Abu Abdullah. So Dabba looked at him and he said, do you mind if I have like some of my things back? So he's like, what do you want? He's like, you know, the coins. He's like, yeah, yeah, take the coins. <clears throat> so he's like, okay. And you know the shirt? He's like, why do you want the shirt so badly? He's like, it's Ali ibn Musa Rada's shirt. He's like, I'm not giving it to you. So he's like, listen, Mr. Thief. You know, I love you. But it's Ali ibn Musa. He's like, I love Ali ibn Musa Rada because I'm going to hell. So I might as well have his shirt on my body. So he's like to him, okay, is there any way we can sort it out? He says, okay, um, I'll cut a piece of your shirt. A piece of your shirt, imagine. He says, I'll cut a piece of your shirt and I'll give you the piece, I'll take your shirt. Thief! So Dabal says, I took a piece of that shirt and he gave me a thousand dinar because I had offered him all of this. He said, I get home and what do I find? These thieves, have, knowing that I'm on my way home, have gone faster than me and stolen my old house. He says, I remembered Ali ibn Musa Rada said that take my coins, they'll be useful for you. Isn't it? So keep my coins. When the people of Qum saw the coins with Imam Ali ibn Musa Rada's name on it, they were like, we'll pay extra for these coins. And does Da'bal need the money now or no? Da'bal needs the money. So Da'bal bin Ali al-Khaza'i narrates, I needed the money badly. And I was able to get the money because he was Imam Dhamin for me. He ensured my journey at the end was a successful journey. But he says that line of poetry I remembered. And that pure soul that lies in thoughts. He says I wondered to myself what does it refer to? A pure soul that lies in thoughts. He said then we heard the news that Imam Ali ibn Musa Rada, the poison was now beginning to affect his body. And the narrations mention that in his last days, that poison was destroying his body. That last day before he passed away. And do you know who my heart goes out to on a night like this? Imam al-Jawad alayhi salam. Because Imam al-Jawad was only about eight years old at the time, brothers and sisters. And he lost his father. The narrations mention that Imam al-Rada before he passed away. What do the narrations say to us? They say to us that before he passes away, he turns around to his close companions. He says to them that they're going to try and bury me behind the body of Harun al-Rashid. Do not allow them. They're going to try and get one of their own men to do ghusl for me. Do not allow them. Take them to a grave. When you take them to this grave, you will dig the grave and water will burst out. Then you'll see small fishes moving one way and the other and a larger fish eating those fishes. You'll see that that grave is prepared for me. Then he looked towards them and he said, whoever visits me after I have died, 
in this land where I am a stranger. I will perform intercession for him on the day of judgment. Ya Allah, allow us to receive the intercession of Ali ibn Musa Rida. Ya Allah, he says that he's the stranger at that time. I say to him, oh Imam Ali ibn Musa Rida, today you're not a stranger. Today we are around you. Today your Shia are around you. Oh Imam, go to the Imams of Jannat al baqiq Go next to the grave of Imam al Hassan and of Imam Zain al Abidin. Go near the grave of Imam al Baqir and Imam al Sadiq. Oh Imam, when you enter Jannat al baqiq go left to the grave of Umm al Banin and see the lady who's a stranger with no one there to look after her. We say, Assalamu alaykum, ya Gharib al Ghuraba. Oh Imam, your grandfather Rasul Allah is Gharib al Ghuraba. Your grandfather in Medina is surrounded by those who hate him those who have no respect for him or his family whatsoever and that's why Abba Salt who many of you went to visit today he narrates that we were surrounding the body of Imam Ali ibn Musa Rida. he said that when we surrounded his body the poison was now surrounding his whole body as well he said we had laid him on a mattress if your father or your mother if they are dying you want them you want their back to be on something soft on something comfortable he said we placed Ali ibn Musa Rada on a mattress it was his last moments he says while we were placing him on the mattress he said to me oh Abba Salt I want you to take all the carpets out of my house put all the carpets outside he said we took the carpets outside he said oh Abba Salt now lay me on the ground he said I looked at him I said to him oh my master why do you want to lie on the ground the poison will hurt you why don't you stay on the mattress he went and he said to him no no lay me lay me on the ground he took his body softly do you know how difficult it was to take this body he lay the body on the ground then he saw a smile emerge from the face of Imam Rida. he looked towards him and he said to him I see you smile why is it that you smile he said because for a moment I want to feel what Abu Abdullah felt when he lay on the ground with no one to cover his body it's as if every Imam of Ahlul Bayt when they die they want to die on the ground to remember the holy body of Abba Abdullah but I look towards Imam Ali ibn Musa and say oh Imam your body lay on the ground but they came to bury you Abba Abdullah lay without anyone to bury him for three nights oh Imam your body lay on the ground but your head was with your body Abba Abdullah's head was not connected to his body oh imam you lay on the ground uh, with no one stamping on your chest uh, Abba Abdullah lay on the ground and the horses began to trample on his chest <laughs> we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to raise us with Muhammad and Al Muhammad to allow us to be amongst those who receive the intercession of Imam Sahib al Asr wa Zaman. And to be amongst those who receive the intercession of Imam Ali ibn Musa al Rida alayhi salam. Ya Allah, allow us to be of those who honor his ziyara this year and every year. Allow us to be amongst those who receive his intercession, the intercession of his son Imam al Jawad alayhi salam. We'd like to thank Sayyid Murtada for allowing us and booking for us this hall in the haram of Imam Ali ibn Musa Rada alayhi salam allowing us to remember Imam Ali ibn Musa Rada alayhi salam may Allah bless him and raise him in the ranks of Muhammad and al-Muhammad we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the organizers and the team under brother Murtada Kanani that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses them and allows them to continue in their service of Imam al Rada alayhi salam inshallah we can all rise and remember Imam al Hussein alayhi salam with the matam ya Hussein ya Hussein سخن. 
خوبه به این نکته توجه کنیم که وجود مبارک امام رضا صلوات الله علیه مانند سایر ائمه تار و اولیاء خدا عنایت ویژه‌ای در هشدار دادن اطرافیان خود به امام عصر مهدی آل محمد علیه السلام و قیام اون بزرگوار داشته در حالات اون بزرگوار نقل شده که راوی میگه خدمت اون حضرت رسیدم ایشان از من پرسیدن تو در قنوت نمازت روز جمعه چه دعایی رو میخونی؟ من دعایی رو عرض کردم امام فرمودند که این دعا رو در قنوت نمازت روز جمعه بخوان که اون دعا در مورد فرج امام از صلوات الله علیه و دعا کردن برای اون بزرگوار است به این که خداوند زودتر امر اون حضرت رو اصلاح کنه و فرج اون حضرت رو تغییر کنه و دولت کریمه اون بزرگوار رو برپا کنه که این دعا با این عبارت شروع میشه اللهم اصلح عبدک و خلیفتک به ما اصلحت بهی انبیاءک و رسلک الى آخره که این نکته برای همه ما قابل توجهه وجود مبارک امام رضا صلوات الله علیه که جد امام زمان صلوات الله علیه حساب شد در این حال از همون زمان امام رضا دست به دعا برداشته بودند که خداوند بستر ظهور اون حضرت رو زودتر فراهم کنه ما همین دعا رو با هم میخوانیم بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم اللهم به ما اصلحت بهی انبیاء که و رسله و حفه به ملائکته و ایدها به روح القدسه وصلكه من بين يديه ومن خلفه رصدا يحفظونه من كل سوء وأبدله من بعد خوفه أمنا يعبد لا يشرك بك شيئا ولا تجعل أحد من خلقك على وليك سلطانا وأذن له في جهاد وجعلني من أنصاره إنك على كل شيء قدير